Hello, my name is Artem Babian from Vancouver, BC, and I'm the lead developer for Serratus, the search for novel coronaviruses. SARS-CoV-2, or the COVID-19 virus, is believed to have arisen in a wet market in Wuhan, China, when a bat coronavirus recombined with the small fragment of RNA from a pangolin coronavirus. This new SARS-CoV-2 virus spilled over into humans since it is capable of binding the human ACE2 receptor and infect people. There are reports of SARS-CoV-2 infections in cats, dogs, ferrets, minks, and even tigers. Biochemical and structure function analysis of the ACE2 receptor and the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein predict that it can infect over 80 species of mammals. When SARS-CoV-2 infects these animals, it creates the possibility of further recombination events with other coronaviruses native to those species. The resulting virus can then re-enter humans with novel epitopes. This would in essence render currently developed vaccines ineffective, or worse, can lead to a secondary pandemic. The problem is that we still don't know the complete biodiversity of coronaviruses in nature. While there are large amounts of sequencing data being poured into SARS-CoV-2, it is the global biodiversity which is likely to inform us of virus evolution. This is also complicated by the fact that most coronavirus species are only known from PCR amplicons and lack complete genomes. To discover new coronavirus sequences, we are reanalyzing all public sequencing data to look for both known and unknown coronaviruses. This is all RNA-seq, metagenomic, and metatranscriptomic data. This is about 3.4 million biological samples, or over 40 petabytes of uncompressed sequence data. Fortuitously, in February 2020, both Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud mirrored the entire SRA archive onto their internal servers, allowing for an unprecedented level of access to this data. To accomplish this, we have developed Serratus, an ultra-high throughput sequence aligner based off of Amazon Web Services. This architecture was designed from the ground up with massive scale alignment in mind. Every design choice came down to aggressive cost optimization and to decentralize the workload as much as possible. This was critical as you'll see that it allowed us to essentially bypass conventional limits on big data processing. The bioinformatics workflow is quite simplified with each process optimized for maximum CPU efficiency, not necessarily wall clock. We achieve scale by running many nodes simultaneously. While the NCBI FTP servers would not appreciate 5,000 simultaneous connections, this is a drop in the bucket for AWS. On a 4-CPU node, we run four parallel prefetch and fast queue dumps, each single threaded to not lose CPU efficiency to sublinear scaling. Instead of writing the fast queue file to disk, it is directly streamed on pipe to our S3 scratch bucket. The way to think about this is that while a 96 vCPU metal instance can process the data much faster, it's more limited by disk and networking I.O. Instead, we use 24 times 4 CPU nodes, in effect creating a RAID 0-like system, multiplying our networking and I.O. capabilities. This means that at scale, we have over 1,400 nodes accessing over 5,800 SRA accessions at once. Since DNA sequence alignment is what is called an embarrassingly parallel problem, meaning that each read pair can be aligned fully independently of one another, we could expand this principle of less is more CPU to another level. As each FASTQ file is being decompressed and written to the scratch bucket, they are split into blocks of about 1 million reads. In this way, each alignment process can process a small block quickly and stably. Again, thinking about this from the perspective of reading data, an 80 million read library is not read once from start to finish, but simultaneously at 80 places. The same principle of CPU efficiency applies here. We use Bowtie 2 with very sensitive local settings, letting us detect divergent viruses from as little as 22 nucleotide seed matches. The workhorse of the cluster reaches over 4,000 CPU-optimized C5 X-large instances for about 16,000 simultaneous alignments. The final step is taking these aligned reads in BAM format and merging them on a high-disk merge node, an operation that is less than 5% of overall CPU usage. To monitor this cluster, we've implemented Grafana to track the performance of the cluster and ensure smooth and stable operation. When an issue arises, we can recognize it within minutes and scale in the cluster to avoid costly overruns. I'll be perfectly honest, 
We theory crafted this architecture, but we were not prepared for how well it performed. Serratus can align in excess of 1 million NGS sequencing libraries per day for about half a penny per accession. This means that our entire search space of SRA data can be processed over a single long weekend. The design philosophy behind Serratus has paid off. We've optimized for cost efficiency at every stage and allowed for fault tolerance at any single processing step such that if an error occurs, it has minimal effect on the overall cluster performance. Using this highly parallel approach, we've bypassed conventional networking and disk I.O. limitations, allowing for ultra-fast alignment. So while we originally set out for a hyper-specific search for novel coronaviruses, it became apparent early on that we could go much bigger than that. Our search query includes all coronavirus sequences clustered at 99% identity and every RefSeq vertebrate virus. To date, we've aligned 3.84 million SRA libraries, in effect creating a viral index of not only every known vertebrate virus, but also their undiscovered neighbors. All of our data is released into the public domain, this is a 100% free and open data set. I highly encourage everyone to take a look. In a few hours of browsing, you can discover your own novel virus. So while we initially thought that this would be a monstrous undertaking, today, Serratus lets us access SRA data at an unprecedented scale. This is an early test showing that if you take SARS-CoV-2 and simply mutate the genome at a given rate and simulate reads from those mutant genomes, at what rate do those reads map back to the original reference? In practice, short read alignment functions well down to about 80% nucleotide identity, as long as the 22 nucleotide seed sequence is able to find a match. So I'd like to introduce you to Frank. He's a vampire bat, he lives in Peru, likes to hang out, and is a total sucker for llamas. In a viral metagenomic sample from Frank, we picked up a few thousand reads that mapped to an RNA polymerase gene from an unclassified alpha coronavirus. You can see that the alignment contains many variants and is soft-clipped. It's worth noting that the conserved cores of these genes, such as the catalytic center here for the polymerase, change more slowly and therefore you're able to pick up more reads in these regions. This is not surprising since evolution is highly non-random. You can see how something like the spike gene is rapidly changing and poorly conserved, while the RNA polymerase is well conserved. With this in mind, when we summarize the alignment data, we can take all 10,000 coronavirus genomes and sequence fragments and use a coarse offset of these sequence to a theoretical pan-genome. This ensures that conserved cores within these viral families are all binned together, thereby increasing our signal-to-noise ratio when classifying libraries as coronavirus positive or coronavirus negative. For each of the 3.84 million libraries, we summarize the alignment data into a human and machine-friendly text summary. This tells you information like the total number of reads mapped, their average nucleotide identity, the distribution of the reads across the viral pan genome, and more. Further, the alignment is broken down per query sequence, which means you can quickly identify the closest node GenBank record matching the library, allowing often for taxonomic assignment down to the strain. So what was about 7,000 reads mapped to a partial genome was actually about 50,000 reads from which we could assemble a 200x coronavirus genome. When we blast the genome, it was unlike any deposited sequence, with the closest known whole genome being the human NL63 coronavirus, which causes the common cold. Serratus is an openly collaborative project. More important than the outcome was the friends we made along the way. For example, when we reached out to Dimitri and Anton, the developers of spades, with how to get the best possible assemblies, they wrote Corona Spades to make high-quality coronavirus assemblies. There are lots of different challenges to RNA virus assembly. Unfortunately, there is no single tool that can be used to assemble coronavirus genomes from all kinds of data. Metaspades expects a metagenomic dataset with multiple species and strains of different abundances. However, it assumes more or less even coverage across a single genome. This means that low coverage regions can be aggressively cut off. RNA spades is aimed at eukaryotic transcriptome assembly and tries to reconstruct all possible isoforms. For a virus, this will lead to highly fragmented assembly. 
metaviral spades for assembling circular DNA viruses and again doesn't really fit a coronavirus problem. So while all these tools could work, none of them are optimal. Thus, corona spades is a special mode of spades that could cope with all the challenges of RNA viruses. It reuses several components of the other assemblers to build a completely new pipeline. I'd like to introduce you to Ginger, a divergent coronavirus we identified in a metagenomic sample from a sick cat in China. As one could see, due to contamination in high coverage artifacts, we cannot separate out the artifacts from the genome well, and therefore the genome is assembled into three contigs. Certainly we could tune a few heuristics here and there in the assembler, but this wouldn't be very consistent for the high amount of assemblies we are planning on doing. Biosynthetic spades is another mode of spades aimed at reconstructing biosynthetic gene clusters. The main idea was to use domain-specific knowledge to reconstruct the correct graph. Thus was born Corona spades. It uses HMM protein models to select the correct path through an assembly graph and thereby avoiding contaminating contigs. So now we know that each edge of the assembly graph belongs to the ginger coronavirus and we can assemble it into a single complete genome with high confidence. Now that we have high quality coronavirus assemblies in hand, the next step in the workflow was to create high quality annotations. One of the use cases for the annotation, beyond furthering our understanding of the genomes, was to act as a QC step for the assembly pipeline. For example, we noticed that some genomes needed to be reverse complemented to be in the expected orientation. In general, we wanted the annotation pipeline to hit the right trade-off between being customizable and working well on divergent viruses and transferring data from nearest neighbors. At a high level, the annotation pipeline works as follows. The core annotation of the genes and RNA secondary structures is done by Vader Viral Annotation Tool. In parallel, we realign the reads from the SRA sample into the assembly. This self-alignment is then used to predict variants, which are mainly used as a QC step for the assembly. Since Vader doesn't make use of all the available COVE-related models in RFAM, we also supplemented the Vader annotations with a scan of the genome for select RFAM models, like the 5' and 3' UTRs. After performing a literature search and trying a few different annotation engines, we finally settled on Vader by Eric Naraki at NCBI. Being a co-author of the Infernal RNA Family Search Tool, the pipeline unsurprisingly makes heavy use of covariance models, which can be thought of as kind of a more flexible HMM for RNA sequences. This is an ideal search approach for annotating RNA viruses, as very often the RNA secondary structures are very heavily conserved. Once we have all these annotation pieces together, we can start to get a visual sense of these genomes that we've derived from the SRA. We visualize the depth of sequencing, we can look for nucleotide variants, and we can double check that the assembly makes sense. I'm hoping that by the time you're watching this talk, we have some of these things already completed. A functional website and API so that you can access viral reports for every sequencing accession, and a dump of all of the data into an SQL relational database for easy querying. The primary objective of Serratus is to identify novel coronaviruses and other viruses and release the sequences publicly into GenBank right away. And I'm hoping that we have a few hundred of these done by now. Finally, besides just identifying novel sequences, I'm hoping to do a deep biological dive into some of these viral families and try to understand better how viruses evolve and change over time. Namely, what can we learn from the evolution of other coronaviruses and how it is spilt over into humans and caused this pandemic. Perhaps the biggest questions raised by Serratus is not exactly what we did, but what this means for the future of bioinformatics. The ability to access SRA data, or really any data set at the petascale in a mere days, means we have to fundamentally reimagine what we can do as computational biologists. There's 20 years of exponentially growing sequencing data that already exists from the world research community. Our job is to stand on the shoulders of that research community and see over the horizon. Serratus is an open science project. All the data, notebooks, and code is freely available. Most importantly, this has been an equal collaboration between many scientists who came together to do something to fight against this pandemic. 
By sharing our methods and ideas transparently, we could riff off one another and create something cool. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in contributing to, please reach out. I'd also like to give a special thanks to the UBC Kick team who have offered project support, especially Nicole and the AWS engineers who answered our sometimes annoying questions. Finally, I'd like to thank AWS for the use of their CPUs. And thank you for your time. Stay safe.